Welcome to the legal discussion of the Environmental Ethics and Justice section. We are considering what it means to be human in light of Sylvia Benso's thesis that all things have ethical standing. To be approached from a perspective of tenderness and festivity. My colleague Diane Dillon Ridgely discusses these concepts in the context of challenges and opportunities facing us in the environment. We now focus on these concepts in the context of the law and the environment. I'm Kathy Robb, an environmental lawyer for decades in private practice and a co-founding director of the NGO Blue Commons, a community blue bank with a revolving fund supporting sustainable water infrastructure projects. Together, we will explore how the law works in the context of environmental standing, how standing has been framed in the law, and the legal challenges to applying standing to the environment, and the increasing environmental urgency and potential solutions. First, let's consider how the law works. How does legal standing differ from ethical or moral standing? There have been ongoing debates about the relationship between law and ethics for decades, falling generally into two camps, positivism and natural law. Positivists state that morality and law are separate. Those that support the natural law concept state that morality is the source of the law's binding power. Positivists argue that the law is distinct from morality because ethics are immune from deliberate change and are enforced by moral, community sanctions or punishments, while the law can be deliberately changed and is enforced by specific stated sanctions. Natural law enthusiasts argue that a strict legal process is the moral currency of law and that law is and must be rooted in ethics to reach justice. These concepts are grounded in philosophical principles that date back to ancient philosophers and were famously highlighted in 1958 in what is called the Hart-Fuller debate through published essays in the Harvard Law Review. That debate continues today. A simple example of the difference between law and ethics is how each treats the Good Samaritan, that person who stops to help a stranger in an emergency. The law and ethics differ on what behavior is expected in a situation threatening to other people. Good Samaritan laws state that there is no affirmative duty to help others, except where there is already a legal duty to protect. For example, parents have an affirmative duty to help because they have a separate legal duty to protect their children. Good Samaritan laws also offer protection against legal action taken against us if the help we offer goes awry or is ineffective or even makes things worse. Conversely, morality and ethics tell us that we should do what we can if another person is in a threatening situation. In considering legal standing here in the context of the environment, we also must define what environment means. It's not hard to persuade us that the environment is important to us. It's hardwired into our brains, really. Diane Dillon Ridgely's story about Ray Anderson asking during presentations that the audience think about their happy place and finding time after time that for most, it included outdoors in nature, is borne out in scientific research. Among the many studies now available, first were studies of hospital wards in England, where all patients that had had the same operation were located on the same floor. The staff noticed that on one side of the floor, patients were recovering more rapidly and were discharged earlier from the hospital 
despite similar symptoms coming in and similar procedures, often by the same doctor. The study, which has now been replicated in other countries, showed that the patients who were discharged earlier all were in rooms on the side of the hospital building that looked at a stand of trees. Those that improved more slowly looked at a brick wall. Similar studies of office workers and their window views established that those who looked at trees, parks, or other natural greenery had lower blood pressures and better health outcomes. Even just looking at photos of nature has been found to affect our health positively. So we know from individual experience that the environment is important to us. In defining the environment, there are many legal definitions specific to the purpose of particular legal statutes. Black's Law Dictionary defines the environment as the totality of natural factors which surround and affect the quality of people's lives. Most legal definitions, including the UN Stockholm Declaration in 1972, cover the environment in relation to humans, referring to the complex interrelationships among elements that form the framework, setting, and living conditions for mankind by their existence or due to their impact. More recent legal definitions internationally are subtly shifting to dissolve the separations of humans and nature and are influenced by philosophy, ecological economics, and science. Still, legislative definitions worldwide generally reference human impacts in defining the environment and factors affecting the existence and development of humans or providing services to humans. Where definitions of the environment are broadened, they still tend to include human-centric values like cultural heritage, man-made environments, sustainable development, equity. For purposes of our discussion here, it seems more appropriate to use Einstein's definition of the environment. He said, the environment is everything that isn't me. This definition is more in keeping with Chris DeBona's discussion of alterity, making sense of that which is not ourselves, and Sylvia Benso's notion that in questioning the mode of being of things, we must let them be as things. Letting things be as things is critical to moving us to environmental standing. So what is legal standing? In considering legal standing, we must remember that the purpose of standing in courts in many countries, including the United States, is to manage court caseloads by limiting litigation to specific cases or controversies. Under the law, we ask whether a person has legal standing and the definitions of moral person and legal person differ. People under the law in standing get the most rights. When we consider granting personhood and standing to other entities, the set of rights that is the gold standard is the rights already given to people. Traditional legal standing categories have therefore developed for people born, a case or controversy affecting them personally. For persons incapacitated, a next friend allowed to sue on their behalf. For non-human entities, largely corporations, ships, and trusts, the development of legal personhood. Shannon Valor will explore corporate personhood later in the context of AI standing. And for the environment, standing for environmental entities has been traditionally tied to property concepts, especially in Britain and the U.S. and internationally in other countries whose law was established upon the English model. The environment is viewed as property 
a resource to be owned, used, consumed, and degraded at will, as once were slaves, women, people of color, all considered property at one time. And standing to sue on environmental harms rested exclusively with people, not nature. Happily, this is evolving. Let's consider current legal environmental standing. This property approach is changing. Diane Dillon Ridgely speaks of environmental personhood and notes that it is time that we mother earth. There is some pre-modern acknowledgement of the environmental personhood concept by philosophers, previously noted by Sheldon and Chris, but the idea was reinvigorated in 1972 with the publication in the United States of a short essay followed by a book entitled Should Trees Have Standing by Christopher Stone. He suggested that legal standing should be extended to the environment, to the air, water, land, and trees. Environmental personhood would recognize natural entities as legal persons, giving natural entities certain corresponding rights and duties under the law. Natural entities would be allowed to litigate grievances on their own behalf in court. The concept was raised in a time when the rivers were literally on fire from contamination and debris. With the public galvanized by photos of those fires, published on the cover of Life magazine in 1969, Congress passed new federal environmental laws, including the National Environmental Policy Act and the Clean Air Act in 1970, the Clean Water Act in 1972, and the Endangered Species Act in 1973 most with overwhelming bipartisan support in Congress that we can only dream of today. We have to ask, if Rivers had legal standing, for example, would the Army Corps of Engineers even consider dredging and attempting to rechannel them? These efforts do not work in any event, as Pulitzer Prize winner John McPhee chronicled in his wonderful and ironically titled book, the Control of Nature, where he describes efforts to reroute the Mississippi to no avail. Should trees have standing also formed the basis of a passionate and now iconic dissent by Justice Douglas, proposing that trees, rivers, and other natural entities should be granted legal personhood and defend themselves in court through the public all involved in a case that challenged the development of a ski resort in the Mineral King Valley in the Sierra Nevada mountains of California. The Supreme Court rejected the notion of standing for environmental entities and also denied standing to the Sierra Club to sue on behalf of the environment being threatened. This was the first lawsuit the Sierra Club ever brought. Clearly, they did better in subsequent tries. But Chief Justice Warren Burger was so moved by Justice Douglas's dissent that he asked Justice Douglas to read it from the bench. This was at a time when the Supreme Court read its majority decisions from the bench, a practice that has fallen away in recent years. This idea of environmental personhood was picked up by a few scholars but largely languished for the next 30 years and did not get traction, in part due to the many environmental laws passed at the time in an effort to protect the environment. Although modern environmental law has not made too much headway in preventing the degradation of the planet. The basic idea behind legal standing is simple. Only parties that have a personal interest in the case can bring the lawsuit. In the U.S., the requirement of standing stems from Article Three of the Constitution, giving the courts power over cases and controversies. This has been interpreted to mean that plaintiffs must allege that they have been injured in a personal way by the injury complained of. 
in order to be heard in federal court. But the problem is demonstrating standing can be difficult, especially environmental cases. Economic harm was traditionally the means to show a plaintiff had suffered injury. Environmental harms like contaminated air and water or threatened extinction of a species might not result in economic harm to an individual, but it's still a harm. In the 1970s, the Supreme Court held that non-economic harm to recreational, conservational, and aesthetic interests can establish injury in fact, so long as the plaintiff, which still must be a person, is among those injured. 20 years passed after Justice Douglas urged that trees should have standing, and finally specific criteria for establishing standing in environmental cases in the U.S. finally were defined by the court in 1992. In this case, the plaintiffs who had previously visited Egypt and Sri Lanka to visit endangered animals wanted to challenge a new rule from the Department of the Interior that said that the U.S. Endangered Species Act was not applicable to U.S. funded projects in foreign nations. The plaintiffs said that this rule would negatively affect their ability to view the species in their natural habitat and objected to the change. The court denied standing under a three-part test it defined. So what was this test? To sue to protect the environment, a plaintiff must show all three of these factors. First, injury in fact, concrete and particularized injury. That means it must affect the plaintiff in a personal and individual way. It must also be actual or imminent, not hypothetical or conjectural. The second part of the test is that the injury must be fairly traceable to the challenged actions. There must be a causal connection between the injury and the conduct challenged. And the third part of the test the injury is likely to be redressable by a favorable decision. This means that the court decision, if positive, will set the injury right. The court applied this test and concluded that these plaintiffs did not have standing to sue because there was no imminent injury to them. They had only expressed an intent to return to the foreign countries, but did not express any concrete plans. In considering establishing environmental personhood, we also must consider what rights and duties might be assigned to nature in granting standing. There are numerous references to the people, which is undefined, under different sections of the Constitution. The courts ignored the different references for about 200 years until in the 1990s, the U.S. Supreme Court said that the people referenced through the Bill of Rights, which is the first 10 amendments to the Constitution, meant those persons who are part of a national community or who have substantial connections to the United States. This definition was not of citizenship, but a much broader connection to the country. Then in 2008, the court said that the people had a consistent meeting through the constitution as a whole, including the Bill of Rights, and added that the people refers to all members of the political community. In the second amendment, the people have the right to bear arms and in the Fourth Amendment, the people are secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures. The Fourth Amendment is the only amendment to use the word persons after people, raising the question of whether the Fourth Amendment covers a broader group than the other amendments. 
To complicate matters further, the Bill of Rights does not refer to citizens at all, but the Constitution does. Only citizens are eligible to serve as president or in Congress, for example. Our heroine in the Spark Hunter file mentions the importance of constitutional rights in the context of her friend's death. They hacked off her arms and legs and melted them down. They extracted her rare earths. We had to get a goddamn court order for burial. Burying a robot is illegal. Yes, so what? How long will it be before the 28th Amendment passes to prevent this barbarism? Courts are still struggling to work out what rights apply to which people. One of the looming questions in establishing environmental personhood in the U.S. and internationally is what rights and duties would a river have if it is granted legal standing? The right to bear arms seems irrelevant to a river or to a trust, but we might conclude that all constitutional rights might be relevant to AI standing. We've just been focusing on U.S. rights and duties primarily. Let's turn to the international law. The international treatment of standing is finding a way to environmental personhood and standing for nature. Internationally, environmental personhood is developing. At least seven countries grant the environment legal rights. Ecuador was the first and did it in its constitution. And a number of others, including Colombia, Bolivia, Chile, New Zealand, Bangladesh, and India, have declared through legislation or the courts that rivers and other environmental entities have legal rights independent of people. Numerous tribes of indigenous peoples in the Americas have also granted legal rights to nature or natural objects. For example, in 2016, the Grizzly Treaty, recognizing bears' rights to exist in a healthy ecosystem, was signed by more than 200 U.S. and Canadian tribal nations. These advances are all part of what's called the International Rights of Nature Movement, which picked up in the 2000s. And advocates of that movement have made great strides in two doctrines, establishing environmental personhood and getting standing for nature. As we have discussed, environmental personhood recognizes natural entities as legal persons giving them corresponding rights and duties under the law. Standing for nature would allow environmental persons to litigate grievances on their own behalf in court. The international movement has encouraged a number of localities in the U.S. to grant rights to water entities in their jurisdictions, including Philadelphia and Toledo, where the Lake Erie Bill recognizing the lake's right to exist, prosper, and evolve naturally was passed, but later struck by the courts as unconstitutionally vague. Still, progress is being made. The UN soft law inclusion of rights for environment over the decades have also have furthered this effort. The 1948 Universal Declaration of the Rights of Man references the environment we spoke of the 1972 Stockholm Declaration. The 2010 UN Right to Water is also towards the environment and environmental personhood. And there are initiatives pending for a clean environment as a human right. There's also a Universal Declaration of the Rights of Mother Earth, adopted in 2010 in Bolivia, at the World People's Conference on Climate Change and the Rights of Mother Earth, declaring Earth a living being with a number of rights, including the rights to exist, to be free from contamination, and to be restored. In this segment, we have explored the differences between law and ethics, the definition of the environment, the historic context of environmental standing, 
rooted in property law, and the current components of legal environmental standing in the U.S. and internationally. What remains to be explored is how these legal environmental standing concepts in the U.S. and internationally are being applied to claims about and for rivers, trees, animals, and climate change. We will also consider questions that arise as we shift from a human-centric to an ecocentric approach to standing, including what duties would environmental entities have? Would a river be held responsible for flooding or a drowning? Where would the necessary funds come from for lawsuits or restoration? Until next time. Thank you.